Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome. Hey there. How are you this morning? We're so glad to be here. Welcome to Covenant Community Fellowship Church. We're kingdom focused ministry where families come first. Just thank God for you being here with us this morning. We are excited about being in the house of the Most High God one more time. We do not take that lightly or for granted, for we know that it is a privilege to be in the presence of the Most High God. So we thank you for being with us this morning. We ask that God would bless you, bless your family. And I pray that the message will be inspiring to you, right? When God calls a family, not a man, not a woman, but a family, then something amazing happens. And we're going to look at that today when God calls a family. So we thank God for you. And uh, if you would receive Lady Trevor as she comes forward. Good morning to everyone. Good morning to everyone that's watching. Um, we welcome you to Covenant Community Fellowship Church, where we are a kingdom-focused ministry where families come first. Thank you all for joining in, those of you who are watching us live and will watch the broadcast. Thank you for joining in with us on this, the Lord's Day, to come together and um just worship God together and hear of his word. So this morning, I'm going to pray, pray this morning for our time. As we approach the throne of grace, I pray that you just block everything out and just focus on the Lord, our God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come together we thank you for this opportunity to approach your throne of grace. We don't take it lightly. And we understand Lord, that it's because you are uh, inviting us that gives us the ability and to come because you accept us. You love us. You're gracious. You're merciful. You're loving. And you draw us with your loving kindness. And so we are so grateful this morning to be able to come before your throne. To, to be able to come to you and, and to praise you and to declare that you alone are God and beside you, there is no other God. So Father, I come before your throne of grace. First of all, thanking you for everyone that's here today. And I thank you for everyone that is watching the, the live broadcast. Father, I ask that you would, you would just um, illuminate your word to us today. Father, I ask as uh, Pastor Frank brings the message, Father, that we will hear your voice, Lord God, that we will hear you speaking to us just where we are, Lord. Lord, I thank you for everything that you're doing in and through our lives. Lord, I thank you for watching over us and keeping us, Father. I thank you, Father, for this time today to be able to come before you to be able to exalt your name in the earth, to be able to hear from you and, and to take what it is that you're saying and apply it to my life and grow and bring glory to you, Lord, in this earth. So, Father, have your way in and through us. Have your way, Lord God, in and through everyone that's watching today. Have your way. We know we can trust you. You've shown us that you can be trusted and that you love us and, and that you, you, we are on your minds. So Father, even if we miss it and we don't see it, Father, I ask that you would show it to us today, that beyond the doubt, without a doubt, we'll know that you are with us. So I thank you for the assurance that's gonna, that, that's gonna come today. I thank you for the love that we're gonna feel today from you. And I thank you for the direction that you'll give us today. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow, thank you for that word, right? Hey, remember, I always think life is for living, right? Life is for living. That's one of our mantras. Life is for living. I'm ready to live. You guys ready to live? I'm ready to live life. 
You know, uh, there was a song, uh, I forgot who wrote it, but are you ready for love? She says, I'm ready for love. I'm ready for life. Because if you're not ready to live, you're not ready for love. <laughs> if you're not ready to live, you are not ready for success. You must be ready to live. Nobody wants to come into a dead situation. <laughs> Nobody wants to unite with you to do anything for a dead situation. Christ came that we might have life and have that life more abundantly. I want to encourage you as you, as you move forward, as you uh, live your life for God. Good morning, good morning. Um, as you live your life with God, let me say that. We got to become, how do I say this? We got to become just a little tougher, right? We, just a little, just a little tougher, you know, a, a, a little tougher skin, but a tender heart is what God calls us to, right? And, and so there are things that we got to know that we can't be turned away from one another, or we can't be turned away because somebody bumped me. Somebody hurt my feelings. Somebody didn't measure up to what I wanted to happen. And now I don't want to be your friend anymore. I don't love you anymore. I don't care about you anymore because of an incident that happened. We got to be a little tougher. I heard something the past week that I thought was very provoking. It was this right here. That death does not happen to life death not death does not happen to life but death is a part of life and, and we got to understand it's a part of life and it's a part of living and it's a part of transition i don't know anybody that wasn't born that death was not a part of their journey it's a part of life Problems and challenges don't happen to your good day. They don't kill your buzz of your good day. I was doing fine until. Challenges and problems don't happen to your day. They are a part of your day. Problems and challenges don't happen to your life. They are a part of life. If you are still shocked and surprised when trouble comes and when tribulations come, then you are naive. Because God told you that in this life, you will have tribulation. You will have problems. You will have a little trauma. You will have some issues that come up. But he tells you that because it is a part of life, when they do come up, be of good cheer. Hmm? Be of good cheer. Why? Because trouble don't last always. Because Christ has overcome the problems and challenges of this world. And so can you and I. Well, I'm like, well, that's, 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 that's what I call good news. Right? Some folks just don't want to be bothered today. But that doesn't have to ruin your day. Sometimes folks come into work and they don't speak because the stuff that they have on their mind that they had to leave at home was so big. And it and and what's happening around here today, I did everything just to show up. I know what it's like to be oppressed and depressed and the slats fall from under your bed. And life is not going the way I know what it is, where it takes all of the energy that you've got just to get out of bed and face another day. When you get the news of an illness. When all of a sudden someone that you've invested your life into for a number of years has decided that they want to do something else. Life is happening every day. I'm dealing with it. The man that I was married to, 
He woke up one morning after 15 years of marriage and three kids and said, I don't like little girls anymore. I like little boys instead. And I like boys instead. Life is happening. You go into work and there is no work. They moved out overnight. It's a part of life. But be of good cheer. We cannot let a temporary moment have an everlasting impact on our lives. We've got to keep going. We've got to keep moving forward. I want to encourage you this morning, keep moving forward. The job ended. Jobs end. You look at the Fortune 500 companies, 450 of them weren't even around 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Stay of good cheer. Learn how to keep a heavenly testimony as you go through hellish situations. My wife don't want to act right today. Kids don't want to act right today. My boss don't want to act right today. Coworkers, come home, even the doggone dog don't want to act right today. But today does not define my life. What defines my life is the hope everlasting that we have in Christ, that I have a promise. I like what the psalmist said, and I believe it's the 25th division of Psalm. David said, I would have lost hope had I not believed. First, I would have lost hope had I not believed. It's important to believe. And then it's important to believe the right thing. I would have lost hope had I not believed that I would know the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That's good news. You have a promise on your life that God will restore you. That the years that the locust and the canker worm have eaten away at your crop, what you planted, and it's, I invested all of this and didn't get anything, God says, I'm going to restore that to you and more. What was taken in battle, oh, you lost that battle, and what was taken unlawful, God says, I'm going to restore that to you and more. In fact, God says that when you and your family, when you turn your hearts as my people, when you turn your hearts back to me, I'm going to give you double of what you lost, double of the return that you didn't get. I tell folks, I didn't give away anything. I didn't lose anything. I invested it in the kingdom of God. And although the market in the, king, in, in, in the world might take a de temporary dip, by faith, I'm believing that it's going to more than double on the other end if I do not faint and keep going. I'm, a re I'm expecting a return. I did not declare it a loss with IRS because I have not pulled out of hope. They say that in stocks, you don't lose money until you pull out. Right. So as long as that stock is there, you still got 30 shares. If you pull out when it's low, then you lost money. But if you let it ride, I've made a decision to let it ride with God. I made a decision that I have to win, but I don't have to win today. But I'm, but I'm leaving it in. I'm staying in the kingdom stock market. Because things are looking good ahead. I've, I've, I've been able to peep and see what the kingdom economy is going to be like in the long run. In the long run, God wins. In the long run, Christ is Savior and Lord. In the long run, I will reign with him. If I don't pull out, trusting God and believing God and investing in his kingdom. Before I even get into the message, I want to say to you, don't quit. Don't pull out. Leave it in. The 401k, that stands for kingdom, right? Leave it in the 401 kingdom plan. And I believe that we will win. Because God has said so. Amen. 
but thank you for joining this morning. Thank you for coming. I love you. Covenant Community Fellowship, for those of you that are, are, are tuned in, I see you online. I thank God for you on one of the platforms. And uh, we love you, and, uh, but we, we miss your presence. We said last week and that Sunday morning worship is not the worship day of the week. It is the day where we come and worship together, where we fellowship together. So if you if we come to a gathering, a covenant gathering, a, a church, if you come and you don't interact with anybody, you could have stayed on at home, right? Because your gifts, you're now coming to share your gifts within the body of Christ in the collective. And we need to experience you. We need to feel you. You need to feel others. Not for the not to have drama, but to have hope and encouragement. So look, we love you. We thank God for you. Excited about this message. A family in their God. When God calls a family, when God calls a man, when God calls a woman. And, and when I look at the life of Abraham, his name was Abram. When I look at his life, I see my life. Abram wasn't a priest or a preacher. He wasn't a deacon or a psalmist. Abraham was a brother that lived life. He lived life a certain kind of way. He wanted to do right. No matter what's going on around him, he had made a decision that I, he wanted to do right. No matter what other people were doing, I'm going to do what is right. In Abraham's mind or person, there was a knowing that some things are right and some things are wrong. And he was just a man, a human being, just like you and I, who looked at their life and little bit by little bit began to reconcile it to what was right. You know, there's stuff that's around your house that is out of place. You know that that bag of shoes doesn't belong by the front door. You know that that stuff over there in the corner, it really doesn't belong there. And you really feel better when it's not there, when it's cleaned up, when you can take a picture of that area and it looks just the way you designed it when you first moved into your place. We get used to things being around us that really shouldn't be there. And, and guess what? And they really don't bring us any joy. But what if every day you reclaim a room? Every day you reclaim an area of the room. And you can take a picture of it and it looks just like what you envision that it would look. Then the next day, it, you, you clean another area. And you, you don't necessarily clean. You reconcile another area of that space back to the original vision that you had for it. And as you reconcile the spaces, you began to reconcile the rooms of your life. And as you reconcile the rooms of your life, you began to reconcile your house. And as you reconcile your house, then you start going beyond your house to your yard, to your car, to the shed. And as you begin to reconcile your life to the vision that you originally had, you start having the life that you always wanted. The Bible says that Abraham was a man that was upright. He came from a family of folks that were not necessarily upright by God's standard. His folks were worshiping idols. They had a moon God and a dog God and a water God and a wind God and a harvest God. They just had gods all over the place. If they didn't understand it through superstition, it became a God. Abraham was, Abraham was a lot like many of us. We were walking along and, and living our life and 
and living life and experiencing life, the ups and downs of the market of life, we were living it. And God says, I want you. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. For those of you that are online, I will also I will bring it up for you so that you can see it. Genesis chapter 12. Make sure I have it up. Genesis chapter 12. There it is. All right. And so I'm about to bring it up now. Genesis 12. If we read Genesis 11, it would tell us that Abraham came from the land of Ur. The land of Ur is in modern day Iraq. It was in Babylonia. Babylon was a real place. One of the most beautiful places on earth, seven wonders of the world is Babylon in Iraq. One of the most historic places, the gardens of Babylon. They built cities and kingdoms and huge metropolises in ancient Babylon. Abram comes from that area. If you said, well, what is his nationality? You would say he was an Iraqi. If you would look at Abram and say, what is his ethnicity? You would say that he was Asian because all of that area over there comes from is Asia. Where Christ was born, that little stretch right there is literally the middle of the kingdoms of Asia and the kingdoms of Africa to the West. God in verse 12, in chapter 12, verse one, it reads, now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Land is always a note, a place of prosperity for people that lived in this time. Go to the place of prosperity that I will show you because on the land, that's where he, that you planted crops and grew food. On the land is where you, you, you took care of your flocks and your herds and your all. So it's not go, going over there to Nevada somewhere. Oh, no, no, no. Go to a land. A part, I, I want to position you in a place He was repositioning Abraham. Verse two, and I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Verse four, so Abram went as the Lord had told him. And he took his nephew Lot with him because they had, you know, with your nieces, nephews, there's some that, you know, you have a really close special relationship with. Lot was one of those who was tied to Abram. Now, Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all of their possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haram or Haram. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. And when they came to the land of Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moray. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Verse seven, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had accepted him. From there, he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. 
and Abram journeyed on, still going toward Negev. Now, I want to draw your attention to a thought that when God calls us, he doesn't send us. When God calls us, he does not send us. I know what our religious teachings say. Well, you know, God called me to Africa. God called me here. No, that's not what I'm saying. Just hear me out. When God calls you, he calls you to come to him. When Big Mama, Gang Gang, whatever you call it, what would you call your grandma? Grandmama, grandmother. Mama what? Mama Lena. <laughs> Big Mom. Mud dear. Whatever it was, when she called you, what did you do? You came, you, you went to where she was, right? When God calls a man, when God calls a woman, when God calls a family, he always calls you not to be religious, not to join a denomination, not to get not to get out the streets, not to stop smoking, not to stop drinking. He calls you to come to him. I thought about when when my son joined the military. When he left, they told him to come to a land far away from your parents. They did him a little differently because he left his car at home. He left all his clothing and all the Jordans and all of that stuff was left at home. In order for him to be a part of the military, the only thing he could take with him was what he had on his back. And when he got there, they took that too. So that by the time he really started training, he was all in. They called him to go to, where was that place? It was in Texas, Arizona, San Antonio, Texas. Adam, you have orders. Come to San Antonio, Texas. Okay, good, good, good. What I need to bring with me? Come to San Antonio, Texas. You just come. I'll work. I'll work with what you got when you get here. Lady T said they took his glasses from him and made him a pair of glasses that came from them. If he had a watch, they took his watch. And I guess he got another watch that came from them. In other words, when they called him and told him to come in order for him to partake in what he had desired to be a part of, he had to be willing to do an exchange. See, as I read this about Abraham, it's not about whether or not he took it or not. I want you to understand that the point is that to really, really be available to God, to hook up with God, you got to be willing to give it all. Surrender it all. Leave it all. He said, leave your country and your kindred and your father's house. I want you to understand that when he said that, see, Abram's well-being was going to be based upon generational wealth that came from his daddy. You got to understand, Abraham knew that if he moved out of position, then it's messing with his money. Is messing with his inheritance. It's messing with his retirement. It's messing with the trajectory of his life. And many of us are on a track with this world that's only committed to carrying you so far, but taking everything you got along the way. Only that when you hit 55, when you hit 60, when you hit 65, you got to go. Oh, and here's your inheritance, a watch. 
a plaque, a clock with a little battery that's going to run out in a moment. Constructed of stuff that's going to fall apart in a year or two. Once you bump it or the kids knock it over. God is saying, I want to give you a destiny. He said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I can't see it. I'm going to show it to you. I can't see it all right now. When you come to Christ, you can't see it all right now, but you got to keep traveling. And if you keep traveling, the land where he's taking you, it comes into vision a little bit more and a little bit more. When you turn away from what you got, you're dealing with sadness. You're dealing with confusion. You're telling me to leave what has been a blessing for me in some ways and what is a hope for me. Leave your father's house. I'm dwelling there because I don't want to pass by. Remember when Jesus made a promise to the church? He said to them, when he says, you know what? I'm the, bride, I'm the groom, I'm the right groom, and you are the bride, and I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he tells you that in my father's house, there's capacity. In my father's house, there's legacy. In my father's house, there's an inheritance. I'm not taking you to a cave. I'm not taking you to, oh, I love you so much. We're going to start over in the hood. We're going to start over in the projects. Oh, this is going to be so great. No air conditioning and, and you know, no elevator. And we're on the 17th floor, but we're going to be in love. Don't that sound? No, it doesn't. Okay. He's leaving what the world told him to build his hope upon. God is saying, I want you to leave that and I want you to trust me. I never really saw that before with Abraham as I read this, right? I just kind of skimmed over it. Go from your country, go from your kindred, Go from your father's house to the land that I will show you. Not that I have shown you, but that I am telling you about. And I will reveal it to you as you go. And if you'll do this, if you where you are right now will do this, that if you will follow me and if you will turn after me for real, for real, if you'll get all in, if you'll show up in San Antonio, I'm going to make you an airman. If you just get here, I'm going to do something different in you that has never been done before and that nobody else can do if you will just come. In order to surrender, you got to come. In order to in order to exchange, you got to show up. You can't make this appointment through a text message. You can't make it through an email, through a telegram. You can't make it through a phone call. You got to show up to God. You got to go where he is. You got to leave where you are in order to go where he is. Because if you never leave where you are, you can never be where God is. Abraham made a decision. I want to be with God. I want my children to be with God. I want those I love to be with God. God says that if you will be with me, if you will leave what you are, what you are holding on to, what you are, if you will leave that to be with me, I'm going to do something special. That's verse two. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to move you beyond being an individual. To being a great team. I'm going to move you beyond having a great marriage, you and him, to having a great family that is bigger than your marriage. 
that includes your mama and your daddy and your sisters and your brothers and his mama and his daddy and his sister and her mama and her daddy and sisters and brother. He said, I'm going to do something. I'm going to create a circle around you and your circle is going to blow up so much that it's not going to be a large nuclear family. It's not going to be a large extended family. It's not going to be a community. It's going to be a nation. I'm going to blow you up where you go from me, you, us, to us, for no more, to where it's going to be a nation. Your impact is going to be national. And I will bless you. And I'm going to make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I'm going to shift and move you from getting all you can and canning all you got and, and uh, uh, taking, taking the selfies in, in France and taking the selfies in, in Algeria and taking the selfies in Alexandria and all over different parts of the world. I'm going to move you beyond that. You're going to do that, but I'm going to move you beyond that. Some of y'all just want to get out the hood. And after you get out the hood, your life is of no value to anybody else except for you. You know them, you see them. They hit that age. When you're living in Birmingham, if you are five years old, if you are a five-year-old child in Birmingham right now, you've been introduced to poverty. 46% of the children in Birmingham live in poverty. If you go on up and you are a young black girl who is 15 years old in Birmingham, Alabama right now, 53% of 15 year old black girls in Birmingham, Alabama live right now today in poverty. Live in poverty. But something happens in the age from 25 to 35 where you've gotten up and you've gotten your money. And now instead of one out of every two living in poverty, it's one out of every 10 individuals in Birmingham that are between the age of 24 and 35 where life has gotten better. And they forget where they come from. And they forget about something that's bigger than them because their God has been the escape of poverty and getting all I can and canning all I got. I never thought I'd be this rich. They either have to leave here say I'm going to live life different. When he said, I will make verse two, a great nation of you. I'm not going to just make you great. I'm going to make everybody that's attached to you great. Somebody said, who's the greatest of all time? Is it Michael Jordan or is it, or is it Bill Russell? Bill, Bill Russell. Well, you know, Michael Jordan, he's got six championship rings. And, and Michael is better than LeBron because LeBron doesn't have six. LeBron has, what, four or five, four. So Michael better than LeBron in being the greatest of all time because he has six championship rings. Will Chamberlain says, the guy says, what do you think about that, Will? He says, I don't. He said, why not? He said, because every week I talk to a guy that has 11 championship rings. I'm saying, okay, that's just hating. Wilt Chamberlain was tall. Bill Russell was tall. But Bill Russell's the only man in the history that had 11 championship rings. Bill Russell didn't measure his success by dominating Will Chamberlain and having the most points and the most rebounds. So where 
Will Chamberlain average 30 something points per game and 24 rebounds per game for his career? Bill Russell averaged 15 points per game and 24 rebounds, a place where he could help his team be good the most. If I had a conversation with Michael Jordan, I could learn how to be better than you. I could learn how to get in your head and dominate you. I could learn how to be the leading scorer. I could learn how to be the best of my time. In fact, they called him Black Jesus is what they called him, right? I could, I could become as big as God. He developed a CO ego or a God complex. I can learn from him how to be better than you. But I can have conversations with Wilt Chamberlain that I couldn't have with Michael Joy. How do you win 11 championships? How do you make your teammates better? One of your teammates, Sam, he had 10 championships. Another one, Casey Jones, he had nine championships. A couple of other ones had eight, three to four had eight. A few more had seven, a few more had six and five and four. How do you make the people around you greater? Well, Chamberlain could feel this area right here with people that were able to stay and walk with him and become great, to use their gifts, their talents, and abilities to become great, to be champions. Bill Russell, excuse me. Yeah, Bill Russell could do that. He could feel the room. Michael Jordan's got a couple that were there. A couple that were with him. Rodman had a couple with him. Scotty had four with him, five. You know, a few other folks had one or two. Bill Russell, 11. Sam Jones, 10. Casey Jones, nine. A few others, eight championship rings. A few others, seven championship rings. A few others, six, five, four. And when I hear people that are bragging about how great they are, I'm looking to see who's standing with them. God tells Abraham, I'm not going to blow you up. I'm going to blow the folks that are with you up so big that y'all going to become a nation. He was built different. So he said, instead of me averaging, uh, you know, I've scored a bunch of points. I've averaged 30 points before in a, in a season, but I'm going to decrease so that the people around me can increase. But where I helped in the most in rebounding, I'm going to excel at. I'm going to get 24 rebounds a game, but he only averaged 15 points per game so that greatness could be incubated around him so that you didn't have to leave home in order to be great. You didn't have to leave your church in order to have uh, an outreach ministry. You didn't have to leave your, your church in order to, to go out and disciple and evangelize. And there's enough room here. Because if, if the pastor understands that God is doing something, not just in me, but in, in us, that pastor is looking for you to be great. Those leaders are looking to push you forward to be great so that you're not living off of somebody else's greatness. What's different? That's what's different about Bill Russell's group and Michael Jordan's group. Bill Russell, he was a tough guy. The, the, the press didn't like him. Michael Jordan, he's like the meanest bastard in the world, right? He's got the cigar. Ah, you see him. He's got this thing. He's got this image. What you don't see is an image of 
the champions that he's made, an image of the teammates that he had, an image of his children and grandchildren. Doesn't go beyond him. I can take all of what I have, all of what I get, and all that I can get, and, and I can make me greater so that the difference between me and you is even greater. But the people that have greatness in them won't stay there. Somehow he kept that team together. Somehow, for years, men that were able, that could have been the Michael Jordan on another team, stayed with him. Not just to be a leader, but to be a part of a team of leaders, to be a part of a team of ministers, to be a part of a team of pastors and teachers and prophets and evangelists. To be a part of something that was bigger than them. See, God had to offer Abraham something that was better than what he had. He had to have a revelation and a hope. I'm not going to trade a dollar for a quarter. At the end of verse two, he says, so that you will be a blessing to others. So that you can help make others stronger. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Everyone on earth will be blessed because of you. That your life will have meaning, purpose. You might not be the glossiest. You might not be the flossiest. You might not have the good hair or the good skin or the good car or the good job. You might not have a good jewelry. But the fruit of your life is all around you. When Bill Clinton and Mother Teresa were on stage together at an award, they were both getting some type of humanitarian award or something like that, one of those big names. She wouldn't come out on stage because Bill Clinton was on there and he had had that affair with Monica Lewinsky. And so he got up to the podium and he answered the question that people were asking. How do you feel about her not wanting to come out on stage with you? And he had this to say about it. It's hard to argue with a life that's been so well lived. It's a higher calling that God is calling us to be a part of. It cost Abraham something when he responded to the call of the most high God upon his life. The Lord God called him and said, Abram, come to me. When he came to him, God repositioned him. He did an exchange. <laughs> I like what Lady T said, Adam shows up at the air base in San Antonio. Give me your old clothes. Give me your old coat. Give me your old shoes and socks and underclothes. Give me your old jeans and shirt. In fact, give me those glasses of what you've been looking through to give the world. I'm going to give you a new pair of glasses because I don't want you to see things differently. Feel things, excuse me, see things the way you used to. Feel things the way you used to feel. Tell time the way you used to tell time. I'm going to give you everything you need to operate on a new level. God's not trying to do no hybrid. A little bit of God and a little bit of you. And to be truthful, the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? I would settle. 
a lot of men would settle if their wife said, okay, you can have your friend. They would settle. A lot of women would settle if the husband said, you can shop as much as you want. We'll build more closets for your clothes. Junior's gone to college. Can't you imagine? Look, we went, we went into a house that was so big at the beginning of this year that we got lost in it. And we went into a room and the room, the room, where, let me tell you where we got lost. We, we turned and we got lost in a room with mirrors and, and, and mahogany and, and stuff that put these cabinets that opened up and they were wardrobe things and shoes. The room was so big. It was like this room, but it was the wardrobe closet. <laughs> mahogany finish and everything. And you're looking and you're like, wow. And there was a bathroom over here. And I, is this the bedroom? No, this is the closet. <laughs> See, if some of y'all didn't have boundaries, if there wasn't somebody to tell, now everybody looking up at the ceiling now, right? <laughs> if there wasn't somebody to tell you this far and no further, it would be hard for you to say no to your flesh if you had an unlimited budget for shopping. Lady T and her two sister friends right there, they wouldn't be going to Paris for ministry. They'd be going to shop and they would pray for the stewardess along the way. They would pay, pray for the luggage handler. Shock like a dot, 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 dot. As they go into the Louis store and the Gooey store and, and, and I didn't even know tennis shoes could come in red bottoms, but they would find them. <laughs> your flesh cannot afford to give it everything it wants and you still be great for God and your life still have a meaning that's bigger than you it has to be an exchange kingdom of God is bigger than you. And so do you want your kingdom to blow up? Your family is bigger than you. Why not make your family blow up? Why make every generation start over again from scratch? Well, me and mine, we are right. It's not enough for you or yours. There must be an economy that you are a part of in order to build wealth. Otherwise, everything you buy, you have to spend your money and it leaves your community. You are not wealthy, you are rich. You are not wealthy, you have money, but when you spend it, it's leaving you and not staying with you. When you spend it, it's gonna build clubhouses and roads and all these things in other communities and you still gonna live in the hood. Look at my car. Look at the community where the dealer lives. Look at my food, look where the grocer lives. Look at all I got from Walmart, look where the Waltons live. Look at all my computers, look where Bill Gates lives. Because all you're doing is you may be generationally rich, but you will not, you will never be multi-generational rich because multi-generational money and currency is wealth. Somehow you figured out how to circulate it. God says, I'm going to make you into something, a kingdom family where you're circulating this wealth. And you're going to touch all the nations of the world. When God calls a man and calls a woman, it's not for status quo. 
It's not so that you can raise the next generation of children in Birmingham, Alabama that are five years old, 46% of them living in poverty. Know what it's like to be resource insecure, food insecure. They know what it's like for the power to be off, the gas to be off. They know what it's like. That's not normal. It's not normal for a 15-year-old girl, 53% of 15-year-old girls. 48% of 15-year-old boys are old enough now to begin to understand the world around them. And it's not fair that there should be so much luxury all around them. And here I see my mama working her fingers to the bones. My daddy working his fingers to the bones and we still have nothing. And they swear I will be different. My kids will have what they need. I'm gonna make sure my mama has what they need by any means necessary. And if you don't have something better for me that's going to change the quality of life, stop talking to me. Don't invite me to your church, your mosque, your synagogue if my mama got to stay in poverty. I can't forget. One of the top three abortion providers over the last 15 years, 10 years, Mississippi and Alabama came from Birmingham, Alabama. He said, my mama walked us three boys to church every day in Wyla. Every Sunday, every Wednesday, we went to church but we were resource insecure. And my mother was working, 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 and she worked her way into an early grave. And I said, I'm gonna be something so that I won't have to be poor. So he became a doctor. But as he looked and he thought about it, how can I use what I have to make a difference? His thought was, or well, one of the quotes as I read about him, he said, No woman should be forced to work herself into an early grave. Be taken away from her family and those that love her. I'm going to do all I can to make sure that another woman doesn't have to be pushed into that situation. The poverty of Birmingham is touching the nation. This, this isn't a political thing of pro-abortion, anti-abortion, how much abortion. It's just the thought that within poverty, that it impacts people, it scars them. And when you're 15 and you're looking at the world ahead, you're making decisions. That I'm gonna do whatever I gotta do not to be poor. And if I'm a young female, I'm gonna use my body. I don't mind being kept as long as I get paid. If you're 15, and if you're 15 in Birmingham, if you're female, 54% living in poverty right now. If you're male, 48% living in poverty right now. And they're making decisions because they're not only living in poverty, there's a good chance they're taking care of their little brothers and sisters. And they're taking care of their cousins because homelessness, you know how that goes. When you come, you can move in with me. So at 15, you're the oldest and mama and mama and sister, mama and brother are out working. Then you're making some decisions and we want to judge them. Look at her. Got those eyelashes, got those nails, got those clothes on. Look at her. Her breasts are out. All of these things, look at her. I'm ready to judge her. You ought to be ashamed.
if you stop and talk and track it back, it would go back to at some point when they, if they were five years old in Birmingham and 46% of five-year-olds are living in poverty, food insecure, da da da, was when they become aware that I'm different. It's when they learn what it is to go to school and you're hungry. Is when you began to learn what it is that when they say we don't have nothing to eat, it means the cabinets are empty. The refrigerator is empty. They learned that at 15. You're making some decisions. You're beginning to look at how the world operates. You began to look at the girls in the videos, the, the girls that are dancing in behind and the girls that are up front. The more raunchier they are, the more over-sexualized they are, the more play they get. They make the guns now. You get... They put uh, where they where they put the chip the thing in the Glock to make it automatic. Now the now just range. The more raunchier you are, don't tell me that they are the problems when we watch it year after year after year. Birmingham's on the way to a record homicide rate in the last hundred plus years. Boys need to get them a job. They need, need to get them an education. They need to stay in school. They need to graduate. But you and I know that we watch for years. At the beginning of the school year, they round up all these boys off of the street. The truant officers hit the street. They make sure that they come to the school so they can get that count and get that money. And then after the, after the count, Labor Day, they kick them back out of school. Do you have a diploma? No. Do you have a felony? Yes. We can't hire you. We can't hire you. But I watch Power. I watch Raising Cain. I watch New Jack City. I watch, I watch, and I watch, and they got paid. Now, the reason why they died was because they did it wrong, but I can do it better. We're going to be smarter. We're going to be stronger. We're going to be harder. And look, I'm not looking to live past 25 anyway. And I believe that we can track it back to where they were 15 and they were in poverty and they're looking and they're taking and they're saying, God, if you are there, strengthen me so that they don't have to go through this. And if truth be told, there are generations of folks from our urban areas, our inner cities, who the only reason why they made it through college, the only reason why they made it through school was because a cousin and uncle who was bootlegger, who was a drug dealer, who made sure that they can get home, who made sure that they had what they needed. Now, this is a good kid. They're going to make it. Now we want to judge them. They subsidize the families. I remember when my UPS truck led me into College Field, back when College Field was College Field. And, and, and I was a new guy there. And, and a couple of guys came over. They said, man, so what you doing? He said, I said, man, well, I'm here working, man. So you're working, taking care of my family. He said, well, look, we just here working, taking care of our family. If you don't bother us, we won't bother you because both of us just want to take care of our family. If the world is not going to make the difference, if, if government's not going to make the difference, if, if corporations aren't going to make the difference, then something has got to make the difference. And I submit that it is the church, that it is not the church, but it is the God of the church who says, I, can, I want to do something more with you. He finished reading his, it's, it's, it's about time to land. Verse four says, it's never too late. Abraham, so Abraham went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. 
It's never too late, you all. And Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they acquired in Haran. And they set out to the land of Canaan, and Abraham passed all the way through that area. I'm telling you that in order to get to where you need to be, you are going to have to move to where you need to be. Not just change geography as far as the, the location. A, a poor community in the West is the same as the poor community in the East. So when Centerpoint, when Centerpoint changed, Y'all remember Centerpoint in the 60s and 70s and 80s and Jeff State was over there and all of that and everybody was like, wow, this is all right. Y'all remember that Centerpoint. But that Centerpoint is not this Centerpoint. This Centerpoint, their poverty rate is, is higher than Birmingham because we saw the migration when we saw the white flight going further east, all those houses went section eight. We saw folks leave West End in the Western areas and sections and go over to center point. Murder rate, crime. Crime rate, crime. We tear down housing projects and give them a section eight voucher. Though we got money for years to help them with home ownership programs. And when we were developing houses, we learned that many of the folks that were in Section 8 and living in the projects, their credit could be better than yours within a short period of time. Just little nit tacky stuff where somebody had a cell phone in their name when they were seven years old, nine years old, little nitpicky stuff. Be why? Because they come from a cash society. They pay cash for everything. So to build their credit, do, do y'all know? Metropolitan Garden, 35203 was the poorest zip code in the nation. Where Metropolitan Gardens was. They used to have another name. What was it? Central City? Central City Projects. In the 80s and 90s, 35203 was the poorest zip code in the nation. But as folks began to make money, there was one sister that went to church, was making money with us, that was paying $600 a month to live in the projects back then. Because that was her community. That was where her child care was. We can judge. That's where her support was. That's where the transportation routes ran. So to move me out to the suburbs don't do me no good. It's going to take a consciousness that we would be a people. That it's bigger than me. It's bigger than me and you. Well, you know, marriage is between two people. Marriage is not between two people. Because we are connected through blood and we are connected through covenants. Your kids are my kids too. Your, 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 your husbands are my new brothers and your wives are my new sisters. My family is growing every day and God wants me to take care of that. Our time's running, so I'll just, I'll just reference. Genesis chapter 17, God says, look, I want you to understand what I'm building with you. You got your blood family, check. You got your servants, check. You got your higher servants, check. I want all of them circumcised. Why not just, why not just your blood family? God says, because I can't do a new thing in the kingdom by only dealing with the folk that are in the church. I can't do a new thing in your life without dealing with the life that is around you. I can't have prosperity here and poverty all around you. I can't have health here and poison all around you. So people are going to be blessed just from being with you. You're going to be a people. So I'm, I want you to circumcise your heart, but I want you to circumcise your servants. 
Those are the long-term employees. I want you to circumcise the hireling. Those are the temp workers. I want everything around you to be blessed, but I need them to be in one accord. So he tells Abraham, circumcise all the male. This is how we do it. There'll be no doubt on who they are with. No doubt at all. I want to invite you, our time is up. Guess we'll pick up Tuesday evening at 6.30. Where do we go from here? There's a natural flow towards the world that moves towards chaos. And when we leave a vacuum, it will suck up anything that is in that area. And God wants to use a man or a woman to build a great nation. He begins with a man and a woman. Somebody that will say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. As for me and my house, everybody may not be saved, but we're going to line up stuff so it's in accordance with God so that God can bless everything that I have. I know in my company, everybody may not be a Christian, but I know in my company, everybody wants to live by Christian uh, morals and values. Don't murder, don't steal from each other, don't kill, don't sleep with your coworkers, spouses, don't lie on, don't bear false witness, don't covet their stuff, leave their desk alone. If you don't cover their food in the refrigerator, leave their food alone, go get your own, right? right? So everybody wants to live by the morale, the, so you align that up so that it's a kingdom culture that is not immoral, but it is moral. So I got to line my house up. It's not that my boy can't smoke weed in my house. He can't come home lit up with weed. I don't even want to smell it. I want to smell certain stuff. And so it, I just want peace too. But I want the favor of God on me. I want the favor of God on my children. I want my favor, the favor of God on my family. I want the favor of God on my coworkers, those that work with me and for me. I want the favor of God on my community. So there's stuff that has to be brought in order here and it goes out. You can't tell me how to live. I'm not telling you how to live your life. As much as that is in me to do, I'm gonna do for God. As much as I can influence, I can influence. We don't control people. But when God gives us authority, we control the environment. We influence those. So that no matter who they are, if they come to work over here, they can't say. They can't show the underwear. You know, they can't, they can't show the top third of the chest. It's a standard. So that when I go into Chick-fil-A, everybody's like, oh, wow, customer service so nice there. This, 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 the dot, dot, dot. When they're on Chick-fil-A property, they know they, they've been conformed and they have a world-class experience when you go. But that same girl was cussing out a lady in McDonald's down in Montgomery. But she knew. But well, this is who I really am. But this is how you really operate. And God will bless the people of God for who you are and those attached to you for how they are operating. Some people are missing their blessing because you haven't brought your office into order. Your little block into order. They're missing out. Our time is up. I hope you guys are provoked. God is calling you today. Are you ready for the great exchange? At the moment Adam got on that plane, he knew he was leaving all his stuff behind. The time that he landed and they were waiting to take him to the ones that had called him, he knew that when he got there, everything that he had was going to be changed. Give me your shoes, your socks, your this. They do it in the military service. They do it when you go to jail and prison, right? They do it. God does it when he calls you to him. If this is your day, I pray that this would be the day that you, you come to God, that this would be the day that you say, God, I want to surrender it all.
God, I've sent you a text, an email. I, I, I sent some money. I paid my tithes. But God says, I want you. I want you to come to me. I want you to surrender all to me. I want you to give your all to me. And I will bless you. And I will bless those that bless you. And I will curse those that curse you. And if you'll bring your family, if you'll bring your workers, if you will bring the hirelings, if you will bring all those that you have influence over to, will they, to where they will love their neighbors as themselves, respect and honor one another, be kind to one another, not steal from them or kill them or bear false witness or covet their stuff or sleep with their spouses or I'll bless them. And if my people, they're called by my name, would humble themselves and pray. The redeemed of the Lord, let them say so and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. I will incline my ear to them again and I will hear their prayers in this place. I will look upon their circumstances and I will get involved. Father, right now, you are the greatest and only hope that we have in turning things around. So I pray, oh God, that this would be a day that a brother and sister will say, Lord, I'm coming home to you. I'm entering to the land of beginning again, where I can take off this dirty old coat, where I can leave behind this resume of my shortcomings and failures, where I can become something different than what I was, where I could have not a second or third chance, but where I could have a new beginning. Father God, for that brother, that sister that is praying for that new beginning, I pray that this would be their day. I pray that this would be the day that they're willing to do the great exchange because they have responded to the call of a lifetime, which is coming to you. I pray that they would surrender. Lord God, receive me just as I am. I am broken, I'm tattered, I am unfinished, but you are the finisher. I've got cracks in my life, but you are the potter that desires to put me back together again. I've fallen by the wayside, but you are the restorer. I've been sick for a long time, but you are the healer. Put my life back together. I believe that you sent Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. Father, you sent him, Lord God, to, to do more than be an example for how I am to live, but you sent him to make peace between you and I. He was built differently because your spirit, he was born of a virgin and filled with your spirit, Lord God. He lived a life that was perfect without spot or blemish. And he presented his body on a cross and we commemorated through communion. This is my body that was broken for you to make peace with God. And in like the same manner, he took the cup that we take in communion. And he said, this is my blood that was shed for you to wash away the guilty stain so that there's no record 
of anything being in between you and God. He declared in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes into the Father except by me. Father, we trust in the finished work of Christ. And we come to you, God, that you and I might be one, that we might be one. You would be our God, and we would be your people. So I surrender to you today. I began anew and afresh with you today. Father, I love you. I praise you and I thank you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's never too late to stop a bad decision. But it's also never too late to start a right decision. Pray and ask God, what is the next right thing I need to do today? And then do it. And then tomorrow, pray again. What's the, what's the next right thing I need to do? And just like bringing your house in order, you bring your life in order. There's always going to be that one. Well, you know, if your living room, clean your bathroom. <laughs> Pray and I'm not there yet, but I'm getting closer. God says I can work with that. I'll receive that praise. I'll receive that worship of a woman, of a man who's getting a little closer. If that was your prayer. I pray God would bless you. Text me, call me, email me, inbox me. If we can pray for you. Abram was 75. It's not over yet. There's still time. There are loved ones that need your prayers. There are loved ones and friends that just need a word of encouragement. You are that voice in the earth to give testimony that God can make a difference. The angels can't do it because they can't be born again. The demons can't do it because they can't be born again. Lost folks can't do it because they don't know God. God is counting on you, and you are counting on God. God bless you. I pray you have a great week. And remember to do it God's way. The Lord hath need of thee. When he calls you, come. When he sends you, follow. Study his words, study his ways, and surrender your heart circumcise your heart, cut away the flesh, all that's not like him, cut it away, and your life will be renewed. God bless you. We'll see you 6.30 on Tuesday for studying God's word. We love you. We pray for you. Have a great day.